Da Vinci Resolve's history dates all the way back to the 1600s, where a young Leonardo da Vinci created his first work of art, Da Vinci Resolve. Okay, I'm sorry, that was a blatant fucking lie. I could not help myself with a dad joke. In reality, Da Vinci Resolve's history dates back to the 1980s. I bet you weren't expecting that from a program that has only become more widely popular within the recent years. But before we get into the history of Resolve itself, we need to take a brief detour and take a look at Da Vinci Systems, the original developers of Resolve before Blackmagic purchased them in 2009. Da Vinci Systems was founded in 1984 and was originally a hardware company rather than a software one, creating color grading and film restoration products. Da Vinci was one of the earliest pioneers in the field, and prior to it being its own company, it was a subset of the Videotape Associates that created one of the earliest telescenes. Telescenes are a device used to transfer film into video, and the Wiz was one of the first of these devices created by the VTA. Shortly after, Da Vinci was formed and broke off from the VTA and was essentially the only provider of film to tape or tape to tape color correction. Anyway, later on in 1986, Da Vinci was acquired by Dynatech Corp, and only two years after that happened, they branched off again into their own entity under the Dynatech umbrella as Da Vinci LLC. The Da Vinci Classic was launched, which was the first product capable of color correcting secondary colors by isolating them separately. It can be understated how important this first Da Vinci system was, as it paved the way for the industry and was a jumping off point for Resolve to be created later on. It was truly a revolutionary product and was by far one of the most popular when it came out. This solidified the company as a powerhouse in the production and editing world and would be the catalyst for future devices and software. The Da Vinci Classic reigned supreme until 1990 when they released the Da Vinci Renaissance, which is similar to its predecessor but was more powerful and ran on better hardware. At the same time, they also created a lower cost variant for smaller production houses and studios called the Leonardo. I'm beginning to sense a theme here with their naming schemes. They would create some other hardware in the 90s, but the real breakthrough was the Da Vinci 2K, which came in 1998. 2K is an umbrella term for resolutions that generally have a horizontal resolution of 2000 pixels, but 1920 by 1080, which we all call 1080p, is also considered a 2K resolution. It's kind of insane that this was possible considering televisions at the time were just starting to break the 720p mark in the late 90s. To give some context for this, both Star Wars Episode 1 and Seabiscuit were both color graded using 2K systems. Now that we've briefly covered the company who ended up creating Resolve, let's get into the first ever version of the software and travel forward 6 years. Da Vinci Resolve was launched in 2004. For the life of me, I could not find the exact month or day. I even tried using web archives and looking at ancient forum posts, but to no avail. If anyone does know, please let us all know in the comments. Anyways, this product was initially a hardware-software all-in-one system, and you could not purchase it like you would today on Blackmagic's website. However, it was still one of the first software-based systems contrary to its predecessors which were all rolled into one system, so theoretically Resolve could be run on any type of system, including a home PC. Alas, it was still essentially only used by professional studios because of its cost and the fact that it required monstrous computing power. Even so, this was a proof of concept that for the first time, an incredibly powerful editing suite would be able to be used by the individual consumer since it wasn't tied to any one specific system. This proof of concept was so incredibly important for the future of home editing software, and we would probably not be where we are today without this first iteration of Resolve. During this time, Resolve did not even showcase some of the amazing features we use today and take for granted, and still cost an absurd amount of money. Depending on the configuration you chose, this price could reach upwards of $800,000. Holy fuck. Anyways, the original version came with three capabilities, which were the color correction tool, Resolve FX for visual effects, and the 2K resolution processing tool. Sadly, there's very little info on the versions of Resolve from 2004 to 2009 before Blackmagic purchased them. Blackmagic purchasing DaVinci Systems would be the event that revolutionized Resolve and catapulted it into the mainstream as well as into the home in the coming years. The CEO of Blackmagic at the time, Grant Petty, had wanted to get the price below $100,000 when they purchased DaVinci Systems in 2009, and little did anyone know, that goal would not only be met, but in the future Resolve would be free to use for anyone. Now if you don't know, Blackmagic Design is a goliath in the cinema industry. They originally started out manufacturing absurdly high-end cameras and other cinema-related hardware. There's a laundry list of products this company created, but nothing compared to their acquisition of DaVinci Systems. Right away, Blackmagic decided to cease the production of every single other DaVinci product like the Classic, 2K, and more, and instead put all their eggs in one basket, and that basket was Resolve. 
It turned out to be a very smart move, as Resolve would slowly begin taking a bigger and bigger slice of the video editing market share, as well as having the prestigious DaVinci brand name behind it. However, not to put the cart before the horse here, Resolve was still a while out from becoming the powerhouse it is known as today. It was still only available bundled with hardware up until 2010, when the CEO unveiled new pricing models for Resolve at the National Association of Broadcasters, which included a software-only version for Mac OS for just shy of one grand. This version would later be released in 2011, one year after the conference announcement. This was a fucking huge deal, and I'll tell you why. Prior to this point, Blackmagic had somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 worldwide clients using Resolve and they were all businesses. But for the first time, that model was shattered and Resolve broke into the homes of small to mid-range editors that were not working on big commercials or Hollywood films. As a quick sidebar, I highly recommend you guys check out the YouTube channel called Learn Color Grading as they have some awesome videos about not only Resolve, but editing and color grading in general. It was here that I learned that before this point in time, clients of DaVinci would travel all over the world just to get their hands on these systems because they were that good. You can imagine that now having the potential for millions of users rather than a handful of businesses, it completely changed how Resolve was used. In fact, if this never happens, my videos would not exist. I cobbled together my poorly edited videos with this amazing software, and the best part is, I do it for f***ing free. So thank you Blackmagic for allowing me to create these videos. Please sponsor me. Anyways, sorry for the ramble. At this point, Resolve had already gone through many different versions, so the first version available as a software-only product was Resolve 7. By the way, it slipped my mind until now, but throughout the 90s and 2000s, Resolve was still primarily used for color grading as that was what the program was known for and was impeccable at. However, this would slowly change over the years as Resolve became more than a Hollywood grade coloring application and transformed into a fully capable editing suite over the coming years. Anyway, version 7 and 8 would come along with a lot of features like 3D tracking. You know when you see those dots all over in behind the scenes footage of movies? Those are tracking markers so you can digitally recreate a camera shot and know where specific points need to be. This is considered an almost required feature nowadays and is useful in so many different applications. It also featured a totally redesigned interface because it was no longer integrated into a hardware system so things needed to be moved around. Since it was also a Mac only release, it supported ProRes from Apple as well as the Red Rocket Digital Decoder from Red Digital Cinema. Resolve was also known for being one of the early adopters using your GPU to render projects, as well as being able to leverage multiple GPUs on one machine, making its rendering speed far greater than competitors. This was not required to use Resolve, but oh man does it make rendering so much faster. These early versions of Resolve were also well known for their node structuring of color correction and effects. Essentially what that means is that it'll show you a visual representation of all of your different edits in a tree form with lines connecting each node in a sequence. Anyways, something super f***ing important happened in 2011, and that would be the launch of DaVinci Resolve Lite. This was a completely free version of the program, albeit stripped down a little bit. Even so, it is absolutely bonkers that a system that used to cost just south of a million dollars could now be used by anyone for free. Sadly though, this initial try at offering a free version didn't work out very well because there were so many core features missing like noise reduction and being able to work in 4K that you almost had to buy the paid version. Blackmagic realizing this somewhat dead on arrival free version was not doing well and quickly fixed this and removed some limitations on the free version which resulted in an absolute horde of people flocking to Resolve to get their hands on it. Some big news would also be announced in late 2011, and that was that Resolve was coming to the Windows platform with the release of DaVinci Resolve 8. Without that one change, I'm not sure it would be as big as it is today, and people rejoiced with this new announcement because they could finally get their hands on it if they had a PC. From here on out, things would only get better and better for Blackmagic and Resolve itself. In 2012, version 9 would come out with a ton of new stuff for people to play with, including the Lightbox view. This was a window that allowed you to view all of your clips in a grid view and quickly adjust any color grading needed on a clip by clip basis. This was a good step in the right direction for making Resolve less intimidating. However, during this time period the user interface was still very difficult to grasp for newcomers and does not look anything like what we are used to now with version 18. Most of the updates for version 9 would be performance related, as well as moving things around on the interface to limit the amount of clicks or actions needed to complete a task that you wanted to do. Along with that, we got the ability to scrub through media with a live thumbnail preview, which is an absolute required feature nowadays, but was novel for the time. 
In 2013, we also got the ability to convert Magic Lantern RAW files into DNG files. These files were raw, lossless output files from the Magic Lantern cameras, which were popular at the time. Contrary to what I thought, a lot of different cameras will output many different file types that aren't all supported in every editing suite, like RED cameras as an example. But something else magical happened in 2013 as well with the release of Resolve 10, and that was the interface overhaul. When I say overhaul, I mean it in the most literal sense. The interface was completely redesigned to help with the problem of newcomers being intimidated by the admittedly not so great interface of previous versions. On top of all that, the free version now supported 4K video, which was a huge step in the right direction for Resolve becoming more appealing to people who didn't want to drop tons of money on software. This was still mostly used professionally because in 2013, 4K displays were basically in their infancy. In 2013, LG was one of the first companies to start selling 4K flat displays for the home. And well, nobody really used them because the price was an absurd $20,000. Holy f Anyways, version 10 would also mark the year that we received the ability to use OpenFX plugins. OpenFX is sort of similar to VST in the sense that it's a platform for people to create plugins that could be used in multiple different workstations, and we still use these plugins in the modern versions of Resolve. Something else Blackmagic had been working on was to ensure that timelines created in Resolve could be exported and placed into other software like Final Cut Pro or Adobe products. At this time, the other software had features that Resolve did not, which you may want to use after working on your projects inside DaVinci. Version 10 was super big outside those features as well because it would be the version that started opening up Resolve to become more than just a color grading application. We also received unlimited video and audio tracks on the timeline as well as other additions like different titles and transitions to complement the new editing capabilities of version 10. We would continue to see updates yearly with Resolve 11 coming out in 2014. The OpenFX capabilities would be expanded to allow the use of third-party plugins, which is super important to people wanting to add more tools to their belt when editing. I think you'll notice that after version 10, much of the changes or additions were edit-based rather than color grading updates. This is because DaVinci was already world-class when it came to color grading, having an almost 30-year history with it at this point. These changes would be for the better in my opinion, and would help expand Resolve's reach far beyond what it used to be capable of and skyrocketed it into the top of the editing space over the next few years. Something I also learned from the Learn Color Grading channel was that the monitor in Resolve was relocated center stage. The reasoning behind this is because previously anyone working on high-end equipment with an external monitor would not really ever use the monitor within Resolve, but now that more and more people were flocking to it, it was becoming more important for people without extra gear to be able to see their edits in the monitor window. These upcoming versions would be vastly expanding the tools available to users, including audio mixing. Now, Fairlight was not yet integrated, as that would come in the future, but we still got enough to work with if you wanted to do some basic audio editing within the same project rather than using a separate program. Resolve 11 was definitely a big turning point for the program that got people excited at the possibility of using it as a full editing suite. Blackmagic would also announce exciting news in 2014 with their acquisition of Fusion, which was an image compositing software. This is what we still use in Resolve to this day, and it's an incredibly powerful tool. I think it's important to credit Blackmagic here, because Fusion was one of the most respected tools for image compositing, and understanding that acquiring it would be a better course of action rather than trying to build something from the ground up. Not only that, but Blackmagic would yet again wow people by offering a free version of Fusion. A small caveat though was that during this period in time, Fusion was still a standalone software and was not integrated into Resolve like it is now. But nonetheless, it was an important step to completing the vision of Resolve becoming a full editing suite. This would mark a point in time where people seriously started considering dropping other professional editing products like Adobe Premiere in lieu of DaVinci Resolve. It still wasn't as powerful in all aspects, but it was getting there and had such strong color correction tools that it was a real debate between people in the editing world. As a side note, fast forwarding to 2022, a lot of content creators would spark discussion on Twitter with a tweet from Corridor Digital's Ren Weichman saying, After Effects needs to be rewritten from the ground up or I'm not using this f***ing program anymore, and would even get Adobe to respond to this tweet. The tides were turning at this point, and people were fed up with Adobe's old engine giving them problems. Anyway, back to 2015, Blackmagic would switch up the naming scheme for Resolve, removing the light part from the free version as it had caught up so much with the paid version. There was still a paid version though, and that would be DaVinci Resolve Studio. 
Now, remember previously I was talking about Fairlight? Well, in 2016, Blackmagic would purchase Fairlight, and this was huge news. Blackmagic now had a fully capable professional audio editing suite to pair with Resolve that I actually use some of myself to make my voice sound less terrible. The reason why this was a big deal is because in the film industry prior to this, most of the time people working on the audio side of things would need to use software created for audio only, and it was not optimized for people working in the film industry. That totally changed with Fairlight though. If you haven't yet noticed, each of these acquisitions and upgrades that we've talked about are all the cream of the crop, and in 2017 it would come to a head with Fairlight being integrated inside Resolve. Fairlight, Fusion, the editing capabilities, and the color grading were now combined into one insanely powerful program that is what we are using in 2022 with DaVinci Resolve 18. Phew, that was a long-winded video. All these videos that I make are not just because I'm interested in the journey that developers, creators, and engineers take to create these amazing companies and products, but also to give you guys just a small glimpse into these journeys as well. My videos would not exist without Resolve, especially not without it being free to use. Thank you Blackmagic for making that possible, and thank you guys for watching. Stay safe out there, and I'll see you in the next video. By the way, I almost forgot, if you haven't already, you can now join the Squash Discord to talk to community members, get help with content creation or music, or just to chat, link in the description.